can begin. And we are good to go? Great, thank you so much. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's hearing of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. I am uh, the chair of the committee, and we are now formally in session. And I want to welcome Council Member Margaret Chin, uh, co-chair of the Women's Caucus, who's here with us today. Uh, and uh, we welcome other members who will be uh, coming shortly. This afternoon, we're discussing a very important and overdue topic, Me Too and culture and the arts. Now, obviously, just about everyone is familiar uh, with the Me Too movement and how it came about shortly after uh, numerous accusations of sexual misconduct against Hollywood producer Harvey Weinstein by many actresses, actors, and others uh, some high profile, some not. Now the term was first coined by activist Tarana Burke in 2006 uh, and uh, has been employed to spread awareness and understanding about sexual assault, uh, particularly in communities of color, uh, affecting uh, many women of color. Uh, saying Me Too unifies those who have been victimized by sexual violence, uh, which includes far too many people, uh, recent poll suggests that 81% of women uh, and 43% of men have experienced sexual harassment or assault during their lifetimes. Uh, my guess is that well, that number may even be low, um, particularly as it relates uh, to women. Uh, now, actress Alyssa Milano um, used Me Too as a rallying cry to encourage people who have experienced sexual harassment or assault uh, using the hashtag MeToo on social media. And following that came uh, a deluge of many, many uh, women uh, and even some men talking about what they have uh, experienced. Now, in just the last few months, uh, at least 150 powerful men have since been accused of sexual misconduct. Uh, ranging from inappropriate texts uh, to groping to rape. Uh, this includes James Toback, a Hollywood writer and director who has been accused of sexual harassment by more than 200 women. He has denied the charges uh, and will not be facing sex crime charges in Los Angeles. Terry Richardson, a high-end fashion photographer, who has been accused of sexual assault by multiple women, which he denies. He has since been banned uh, from Condé Nast. Kevin Spacey, an Academy Award winning actor, who's been accused of sexual assault by several men who are much younger than him at the time. Obviously, uh, he has um, been denied his role in House of Cards, among other things. Uh, there have been others. Adam Vennett, a powerful Hollywood agent uh, who former NFL player and current actor Terry Crews accused of groping him uh, in front of others uh, at a party. Uh, Vennett was suspended for one month before returning to work and will not be facing criminal charges after prosecutors decided not to move forward uh, with this case. And there are many other cases. So from the allegations against Harvey Weinstein in particular, we recognize that there are certain power structures and vulnerabilities that artists and cultural workers are subjected to. Uh, the ingrained casting couch culture in Hollywood has allowed countless powerful figures to intimidate, coerce, and rape actors and employees. Then this past weekend, high-end fashion designer Karl Lagerfeld uh, revealed his own dated attitude towards sexual harassment in an interview where he said that he was fed up with the Me Too movement and questioned starlets who have taken 20 years to remember what happened. Regarding a wide range of sexual misconduct by more than 
uh, 50 models, including uh, yanking their breasts, touching their crotches, or aggressively pulling down their underwear without asking them during shoots uh, uh, against Carl Templer, the creative director of Interview Magazine. Uh, Lagerfeld expressed disbelief and then insisted that if you don't want your panties pulled about, don't become a model. Um, obviously, that is reprehensible, um, but there are still many who believe these things. Of course, we can't talk about this issue without talking about Donald Trump, uh, the president, who himself has boasted about his own sexual misconduct. All of this is simply unacceptable. Sexual misconduct has no place in our society, let alone our places of work or sacred institutions of art and culture. Uh, the Me Too movement is relevant in every aspect of the cultural uh, and arts communities. And the modern Me Too hashtag movement not only came out of the cultural and artistic communities, but it has provided a lens through which we are reconsidering and recontextualizing artwork and how to respond to behavior at a time when society determines how to grapple with the scope of this issue. As chair of this committee, I will continue to work with my colleagues uh, in government to promote arts and culture and to support artistic endeavors that aim to engage with the issues brought up by the Me Too movement. Now, the Department of Cultural Affairs uh, and Commissioner Finkelpearl, who is here, recently held office hours on sexual harassment and the cultural community, highlighting resources and partnerships. We look forward to learning more about those resources and partnerships and ways in which we can recognize the value and importance of art and culture in light of the Me Too movement. Today we also want to hear more about how members of the cultural community uh, themselves have faced issues of sexual harassment, uh, sexual violence, uh, and what the Me Too movement means to them. Uh, we're also interested in how art and culture have been employed in this era of political uncertainty and to explore new ways to hear concerns and suggestions to address those issues that may be unique to the cultural and art industries. Art has the ability to harness the power of expression and provide outlets to address Me Too, both within and beyond our communities. As such, we want to learn more about the ways in which art is integrated into transformative programming and services for victims and survivors. Uh, we also want to learn more about how the department uh, intends to continue utilizing the arts to effectively service the community in light of the Me Too movement. So I want to thank and recognize uh, we've also been joined by uh, members of the committee, Majority Leader Lori Cumbo and Councilmember Joe Borelli, uh, in addition to the fabulous Margaret Chin, who I introduced earlier. Um, and I want to thank uh, the staff, uh, including my staff, David Ginsburg, our legislative director, uh, as well as our committee counsel, uh, Brenda McKinney, to my right, and legislative policy analyst, Chloe Rivera, uh, to my left, and senior finance analyst, Alia Ali, who is not here with us. So uh, obviously an incredibly important time in our country, uh, and of course the world, uh, a very important time for our committee. And again, I wanted to have this committee and I wanted to have this topic because I feel like there are so many women and even some men who in our community in particular are incredibly vulnerable and have been for a very long time um, and we're just starting to see more come to light but um, with that I want to ask our council to administer the oath to Commissioner Finkel Ferrell before he begins his testimony. If you could please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council members' questions? Uh, I do. <clears throat> Commissioner Finkelperl. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Van Bramer and members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss the critical issue of sexual harassment in the cultural community. Over the past few months, there have been an onslaught of stories about sexual harassment in the workplace implicating a wide range of industries. The appalling reality is that arts and culture community has been the source of many of these incidents. <clears throat> these disturbing stories highlight an urgent problem that we must take efforts to address 
um, to understand and address. People are courageously coming forward to expose what has been happening in our industry and to begin to put an end to it. This is an issue that we have, um, that we have to face head on, one brought forward by brave people that need to be acknowledged and supported. In addition to these individual acts of courage, we also need to examine the power dynamics that have allowed this behavior to go relatively unchecked for so long. My agency's efforts to promote diversity, equity, inclusion, that is DEI, <clears throat> focus not only on who is working in the cultural sector, but who has a seat at the table when decisions are made. I believe that there are steps organizations can take to create a safe environment where diverse perspectives are represented and respected. These include, but are not limited to, having women, trans and gender non-conforming individuals, and people of color in leadership positions within organizations and on boards, and making anti-oppression and anti-harassment training more widely available to all staff. One way we're working with the cultural sector <clears throat> to promote equity and inclusion is by requiring the 33 members of the cultural institution group to adopt their own DEI plans. These will be among the first cultural institutions in the country to adopt such plans. This could provide a template for moving forward toward a more equitable and inclusive cultural community. A true DEI policy must include the creation and protection of safe, work, safe workspaces for all employees. <laughs> employees should be able to hold employers accountable for their actions in ways that are widely known, transparent, and safe. In addition, employers uh, could make available appropriate resources for emotional and medical support as well as legal recourse. Many of these themes came forward during the public engagement process of Create NYC. As part of our commitment to continuing a dialogue we opened up uh, during the cultural plan engagement process, we convened a Create NYC office hours with the commissioner to talk about sexual harassment in the arts and cultural community last month at the Whitney Museum. In attendance were workers from a variety of cultural institutions, both large and small, and we were particularly gratified that a group of CUNY students showed up because of their dedication to addressing sexual harassment. At the convening, the Department of Cultural Affairs was accompanied by staff from two sister agencies, the Commission on Human Rights, the CCHR, and the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence, OCDV. They were able to lend expertise and offer avenues for help. <clears throat> the experts from these two agencies spoke of legal protections and resources for emotional support in the wake of sexual harassment in the workplace. A lot of the questions that this event, um, <clears throat> this event covered areas of workplace harassment that are currently accounted for under the law. But some questions pertain to newer modes of harassment that take place online. These new varieties seem particularly difficult to address as the perpetrators may be anonymous or hiding behind an identity they adopt. They also seem particularly difficult to stop and the volume <clears throat> of frequency at attacks can be unbearable. Regardless, there are steps that any responsible employer can take to ensure that they are responding to harassment claims to the best of their ability and creating safe work environment for their employees. I'm grateful for the expertise of CCHR and OCDV at this event because they were able to lead a discussion on how to engage the organization's human resources department. However, as one participant pointed out, many cultural organizations across the city are too small to have an HR director, let alone an HR department. Of the approximately 950 organizations we fund, around half have budgets of $250,000 or less. These are organizations that sometimes have two, one, or even no full-time employees. At the convening, we committed to coordinating HR training offered <clears throat> by CCHR for these smaller groups. In addition, these groups will be able to um, talk about their institutional structures, how harassment may happen, and offer ideas to seek advice on prevention. We're also exploring new ways to use creative practices to support people who are vulnerable to harassment. One of the four new public artists in residence, or pairs, my agency announced in January, is with the artist Tatiana Fazlaliade. Fazlalizade, sorry, uh, who is working with CCHR. As a woman, as a street artist and painter, her series Stop Telling Women to Smile takes aim at gender-based street harassment around the world. She will work with CCHR to continue to support people facing discrimination, particularly women and girls, and to educate the public on discriminatory behavior. 
Through the Mayor's Grant uh, for Cultural Impact, which funds partnership between city agencies and cultural nonprofits, we're all supporting Hands Are For Holding. This is a collaboration between Gibney Dance and the Mayor's Office to Combat Domestic Violence that uses dance as a tool preventing, uh, for preventing teen dating violence and promoting healthy relationships. Sexual harassment is not new or specific to the field of arts and culture. Today we are in what I hope is a paradigm shift in which people are being held accountable for their abuse of power and discriminatory and predatory actions across all sectors. A major part of the problem has been the atmosphere of fear and silence that has shielded perpetrators and suppressed victims' voices. Thankfully, we seem to be turning a corner. This is necessary <clears throat> and long overdue. Several actors in the cultural sector have taken a lead in these issues. The New Museum hosted a series of workshops last month to, as they put it, provide tools, support, and guidance for both leaders and workers in the arts and culture to combat sexual harassment and discrimination in the workforce. I'm glad to see that the New Museum is here and will testify in a couple of minutes. In addition, in October, over 1,800 women and gender nonconforming people in the art world signed an open letter titled, We Are Not Surprised. The letter states, <clears throat> where we see the abuse of power, we resolve to speak out, to demand that institutions and individuals address our concerns seriously, and to bring these incidents to light, regardless of the perpetrator's gender. We need to work together to change the workplace environment, to promote healthier interactions among staff, boards, artists, and others. DCLA looks forward to continuing to learn more about this important issue and offer our unwavering support and commitment to moving this cultural sector forward. Thank you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, <coughs> Commissioner. Um, I know you've had a, a busy day. I saw you out there this morning um, uh, shepherding the removal of the J. Marion Sims uh, statue, um, uh, among other things. So you say in your, your testimony, and, and obviously I agree, sexual harassment is not new or specific to the field of arts and culture, but um, I'm sure you agree that um, the, the arts, culture, the performing arts perhaps in particular, there are um, in particular a disproportionate number of men who sort of run many of the organizations and then uh, uh, a lot of uh, women and some men who are incredibly vulnerable um, as they uh, audition or um, try out or are seeking to advance in their careers as anyone else would. So, a, do you agree with, with that, that in our field uh, there are particularly uh, vulnerable people? And um, uh, I'm interested to hear your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, I think there's no question about that. And that, you know, as I said at the beginning of the testimony, it's just appalling to see the kind of cascading series of allegations, and, you know, which I believe many of which are correct against cultural organizations and cultural leaders, which is, you know, so that's why we um, decided to do the open office hours and to talk about it at the Whitney, but I also think that the fundamental problem uh, that you're discussing, which is maybe that the power structure of these cultural organizations would be better served by a more diverse group of leaders. And that is part of the um, diversity, equity, and inclusion plans that we expect cultural organizations to be adopting. I think that, <clears throat> you know, there's been a, a, a concentration, especially in the larger institutions of male leadership, some of which has proved out to be problematic. So I, I think that the diversity, equity, inclusion plan is not separate from the issue, and that's why I wanted to put it into the testimony. No, I think it's definitely a part of the, the solution here. Um, but one of the other things we talked about uh, planning for this meeting, and you address it somewhat in, in the testimony. Um, obviously, a lot of these, a lot of our organizations are very small, and uh, not only don't have HR departments, but, but uh, have very little in the ways of structure. And if uh, you are in a small environment, and there's an artistic director, and that is the founding, and an executive director, um, and someone is uh, harassing or subjecting someone to acts of violence, there is no one to go to. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, I, I know that the work with C CCHR and others 
is terrific, but should the department have someone who can be that liaison? Because in larger organizations, uh, we make sure, uh, because often it is the CEO or the president or the um, vice president who's doing uh, things like this and abusing their power, and, and you make sure that there's somebody within in that organization who, who women can know that they can mm -hmm. report this to and be safe and not be retaliated against. Um, but should the agency itself have a liaison, have a point person for those roughly 425 organizations that you just talked about below uh, a budget of 250, um, who can those women turn to? Yeah, so I mean, I th this is something obviously was discussed at the meeting there, and that's, so I think what we want to do is to meet with this, we, we have another um, session coming up, there's going to be a training, an HR training, with the actual experts, and it was really great to have CCHR, we had three lawyers there uh, who really had the depth of knowledge. So we're not an enforcement agency, you know, we're not an investigative agency, but there is an enforcement agency, an investigative agency, there's the police department, and there's, um, you know, human rights. So the, the, I think we want to have the meeting to understand what the issues are with these smaller groups. And I do think you're exactly right. You know, if you're in a big organization, there's a policy. People know what the policy is. You know, if you're being harassed even by the executive director, you go to the HR department. It's confidential. You know who the person is. But we we're talking about even the problem of, you know, things like completely very unregulated environment, like the studio visit. Like you're there and there's just two people there and there's a power dynamic. Um, how does that work out? What kind of employment situation or non outside of employment situations? There's a lot of ambiguous things that go on and that put people in powerful positions in contact directly with people for whom you know, they are beholden in some sense. So anyway, so that's our next step. You know, this is something we open up a dialogue. We realize that this is an important issue. And the next step is to meet with the groups and find out what the next, what the appropriate thing is. But also to understand, for the groups to understand that there is an avenue, that if you go to CCHR's website, there's a button that's, you know, to report harassment right there. I understand that you're not the enforcement or investigatory uh, agency <clears throat> and, and you'd be more uh, a source of of, that's trusted mm -hmm. uh, and then can refer uh, uh, people but a lot of folks don't know who CCHR are yes. right. um, but if you're uh, an artist and you're a, a cultural worker uh, many know the Department of Cultural Affairs so um, so you're open to considering whether or not someone in your organization could be a, a liaison to cultural workers and artists in the city uh, at least for the purpose of, of taking uh, <coughs> uh, concerns and complaints and then obviously putting them in touch with those who could actually. Yeah, so I'm open to it. I think at the point of the meeting, or not the point, one of the points of the meeting, or one of the takeaways of the meeting was that idea, you're right, that folks in the room maybe hadn't even heard of the agency. They have heard of our agency. They haven't heard of CCHR. But we're in the room together and it was like, oh, here is the group of people, and here are the lawyers, and OCDV was there as well to deal with issues like, you know, of trauma, et cetera, extra legal issues. So it seemed like the introduction was an extremely important thing to, to have done, so to open the doors. Talk to me a little bit about um, reporting. Um, you know, we just passed a very important package of bills here in the City Council, and uh, one of the things that's really important to me is that um, organizations that receive funding uh, from the from the city should be transparent about the reports of sexual harassment within their organization and should actually also report what is done about those uh, complaints, what's substantiated, what's not, what actions were taken against, for example, an executive director, artistic director, um, if the complaint is substantiated. Um, is there any such mechanism currently for the Department of Cultural Affairs, and I'm not just talking about your agency, but I'm talking about all those organizations that you fund? 
Do you get so, any of that information? So let's just say you had an organization that we fund mm -hmm. and that receives cultural development fund, uh, uh, yeah. uh, <clears throat> and there is uh, uh, an executive director or CEO, or artistic director, who it's known uh, acts inappropriately, has had allegations leveled against him. Um, what do we do in those cases? So, the so first of all, I'm not. I've been beginning to get briefed on those new laws that passed. I know some related to city city government, how we operate ourselves, and some relate to how people who do business with us operate. So I'm not fully. And I do expect to be fully briefed on that and actually get training ourselves in the new ways we have to hold ourselves accountable. But so there. So are you talking about cultural organizations where there has been a criminal complaint? or where there are allegations or, because if there, so organizations that get funding from us are required to, you know, report any illegal activity, anything that breaks the law, that absolutely could be grounds for denying funding to an organization if there's legal. Now, in some cases we're talking about something, there's a rumor or there's a, you know, allegations or something, but if, if there's illegal activity, absolutely that is grounds right, for denying funding. As I mentioned in, in, in my testimony, um, allegations of sexual harassment often aren't uh, treated as criminal matters or, or there is no criminal prosecution. What happens much more frequently is those things are uh, dealt with within the organization or at the board level. Um, <coughs> if they're dealt with at all, sometimes they're just uh, um, uh, pushed under the rug. Um, and, and sometimes the complainant is retaliated against, fired, or, or, or uh, you know, told they're never going to work in this town again kind of thing. Yeah. But I, I, I guess mm. it's, it's sort of more than just rumor, but less than criminal yeah. prosecution. So to what extent is that brought to the agency's attention? If at all. So there's a differentiation also between the CIG where we do sit on the boards and we understand the board activity. Uh, and our cultural organizations who simply get a fun get funding from us. So the funding under the so we would be aware if anything was brought to the board attention uh, of what was happening and how the cultural organization is handling that. Um, so that obviously there have been issues like that at cultural institutions in recent years, and uh, for you know, and in in some cases those have been appropriately handled. And I'm not necessarily going to go into details on that, but you know, for example, what happened at Lincoln Center, a director was dismissed because he had you know, broken certain policies. It wasn't sexual harassment exactly, it was a consensual relationship. But that was reported to us, and we understood and we felt that that was appropriately ha handled by the cultural institution. In the case of um, the CDF applicants, for example, those are organizations where, as you know, we're funding particular activities. We don't sit on the boards. So it's, a lot of it has to do with public service. So uh, there could be a cultural organization that's doing you know, tremendous community work, and there's something else happening in a different part of the cultural organization that's not necessarily reported to us. We don't have a mechanism to collect on 950 organizations all of the information about everything that's happening in the organization. We hold people accountable for what we fund. Um, but obviously, if any th allegations come to us, we would refer them to CCHR or the police department if there's criminal allegations. So that hasn't happened when I've been commissioner that something has, an allegation has come to me about criminal activity. Right. So uh, I want to <coughs> invite my colleagues to uh, speak as, as well. but. I think, look, I think the new package that we passed is going to go a long way towards yeah. helping with this, but I think there has been and continues to be uh, a problem with transparency when it comes to these issues, particularly at uh, smallish nonprofit organizations yeah. where the executive director is, sits on the board, has a great deal of friends on the board. You know, everyone in the agency sort of knows that person is widely known to be inappropriate. And, and um, sometimes there are allegations, uh, sometimes there are complaints filed, uh, uh, either nothing is done or, or yeah. it goes unreported and there's just a, the lack of transparency feeds this 
uh, really systemic problem, um, and it's gone on for uh, an incredibly long time, obviously, and, and I think the more transparency we can get, uh, the more sunlight, uh, the more we'll know, uh, and workers, particularly women, will be safer um, uh, at work. Um, can I just make a quick comment on that? Yes. So I think a really, and again, this is just from what I've read in the paper, a classic example of that was the um, allegations that have been brought against the architect uh, Richard Meyer last week. And, be, and this was a long-standing set of uh, predatory behavior, I might say, if the allegations are correct. And I have no reason to disbelieve them. It's many women have come forward. The problem, as you're stating, is that he is the brand, right? So he is the person who brings the money to the plate for that architecture firm. And people were terrified to bring a complaint against somebody because they felt it could be jeopardizing the entire operation of the firm. So that thing where you have the brand, in a way, of the organization being one person right. is, is endemic to these smaller organizations. Yeah. I think that's uh, so. Um, I, I want to uh, also recognize we've been joined by the amazing um, uh, and fierce uh, council member Helen Rosenthal, uh, who I referenced the package of uh, 11 pieces of legislation uh, that we passed last week that's been so incredibly instrumental in, in passing that through. Um, and, and before I, I call on um, uh, council member Chin to go first in this very, very strong and powerful row of women to my left. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I want to just uh, reiterate, because I told this story when we passed the bills last week, um, yeah. and it, it, it sort of, to me, is indicative of all the problems that we face. And, and, and I want to say women experience this almost on a daily basis since the beginning of time. The fact that I myself had this experience when I was 20, working for a nonprofit agency where the executive director, who was incredibly powerful, um, uh, made very inappropriate comments towards me, uh, then started touching me and, um, and wrote me inappropriate notes. Um, and, and I was 20 years old, and, 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 and he was a legend in the gay community, and, you know, and it was just like, oh my God, I don't want to like, you know, do anything bad. And people were like, he's really powerful, and yeah. you know, didn't know who to speak to, was terrified, but ultimately did find a colleague who I confided in, who then said, you know, uh, you know, Greg over there is going through the same thing. Uh, he does this to everyone, and, and it's a real problem. We did file, ultimately, a complaint with the board. Um, uh, they stood by him, of course, um, and ultimately, um, he was, uh, he retired or resigned several months later. But I raised the issue because I think until it happened to me, and I spoke to my colleague, it had been going on for years, right? That was just how yep. he was. When young men came into the agency uh, who he liked, he did all sorts of inappropriate things. Um, again, this happens far more to women, and I, I want to um, stress that, but um, because I know that that happens in so many agencies, it's really important for this transparency to, to have this record of where are the complaints coming from? How is the agency handling them? Are they being treated seriously? What happens when they're substantiated? Um, what penalties do these powerful men face, if any? Um, those are really, really important to address, um, and obviously particularly um, in the cultural sector for us, because we care so much about, about this. So with that, Council Member Chin. <coughs> Thank you, Chair, for this important hearing. I, I just want to follow up with a question, uh, Commissioner, on your testimony, that you said that the agency's uh, effort to promote DEI, the diversity, equity, and inclusion, and that you are requiring the CIG to also develop their own plans. That's great, but there are other cultural institutions that are not CIG, so is the agency also working on helping these other cultural institutions um, yeah. to develop um, the DEI plan? That's, that's one question. And then the other thing is that I do want to emphasize on what uh, the chair said earlier, that being the Department of Cultural Affairs that is known uh, to all the artists and cultural group, 
that I do see uh, your agency having that role of really providing the information and people, you know, that's the first group that people, first place that people would think, maybe I can get some help or get some information. So I think it would be great if your agency do provide uh, that expertise, that resource, and to be able to collect um, information about what's going on in these cultural institutions that you can be the point uh, even to help provide training uh, to the cultural organization and to their staff, to their artists, in terms of how to fight against you know, uh, harassment, sexual harassment. So I think that's an important role that I really urge you to, and we can help you do that, right? So but I, I think you have a, an important role in that. Let me answer the first, second question first, and then the first. So we, again, we're not the experts, because we don't have the lawyer. We have lawyers on our staff, some of which are here, and they're experts in art law, in contracts, sometimes with real estate. The people, we do have lawyers and experts in city government who are experts, and those are the lawyers we brought with us to the Whitney, and we're gonna bring forth. So CCHR does trainings, so we're gonna organize a set of trainings for the smaller groups, but it's not us doing it. You see what I'm saying? So it's a conduit to information. Rather than us providing the services, we're saying there's a group of people, of smart people with all the experience necessary within city government, and we're gonna be the liaison to make sure that you know who you should be going to, and it is CCHR and their lawyers, rather than our lawyers who are dealing with you know, intellectual property questions and uh, oh, I, I, I agree with that, yeah, yeah. but uh, my, my point is really your agency, as the agency that someone, if they have an issue, they have a question that they can call so that you do have someone, you still have your staff to be able to point the person to the right direction or to be able to sort of encourage them to come in and then you can do the referral. Because like oftentimes people don't know who to call. Mm -hmm. And if, if you're the institution that they get funding from or they have uh, worked with you, it's really as important as you as the intermediary to really work, kind of get them the resources they need. And I think that's what I'm... Yeah, and so I, I, the idea of being the intermediary and understanding, for us to understand better exactly, and by the way, it's been really helpful to have the artists in residence at these other agencies because we're talking to other agencies in a much more complicated daily basis. And so we've got people at other agencies that we can call, like CCHR, we didn't have a lot of contact with, but then having these bridges to other agencies has been quite good. So the idea that we can, you know, get, be the referral point or to say, here's where you can get the help you need is quite different than saying, here's, we can provide that service for you, because that's what I'm saying. So then the other question that you had related to diversity, equity, inclusion plans. So we have now also in the other funding, you know, part of the agency, as you know, the CDF, there are now questions that re relate to diversity, equity, inclusion, two new questions on the um, application that happened this year related to staff and board on the one hand and audience on the other hand related to diversity. But so as we understand it, we don't think that there are any, we, we have yet to see diversity, equity, inclusion plans adopted by boards from cultural institutions in New York City. We're beginning, we've been asking this question publicly, almost nobody has it. So this, we're kind of inventing the wheel, not reinventing the wheel. <clears throat> Colleges and universities have these, businesses have these, you know, private businesses, for-profits. Cultural institutions don't tend to have these plans at all. We're looking all over the country for these plans. So I think that having 33 institutions by this time next year who have a ad board adopted diversity, equity, and inclusion plans is going to lead the way to show what a plan looks like for other cultural institutions. So I think that's going to be quite helpful for the CDF groups, the other 900 groups, um, to have those plans that they can look at and understand what the constituent elements of a good diversity, equity, and inclusion plan will be. Thank you. Um, Majority Leader Cumbo. Thank you, Chair Van Bramer. And I want to thank you for hosting this very important hearing at this time. And I really want to thank you for your voice 
um, and your passion on the removal of the Dr. James Marion Sims sculpture. I want to thank uh, Councilmember Helen Rosenthal for the incredible work that she did on this very monumental, extraordinary package of leadership surrounding uh, sexual harassment. And I believe that the work that you are doing and that all of us collectively as a women's caucus in this body have led ultimately to this victory um, for the nation. And I want to thank uh, now Councilmember uh, Margaret Chin as chair of the Women's Caucus and the package of legislation that we pushed forward, um, also led by Councilmember Inez Barron, who played an instrumental role um, in having uh, this particular sculpture removed from Central Park after 84 years. And this is so important to me personally as an African-American woman because to know of the torture and the humiliation and the destructive behavior of Dr. Sims to see uh, this particular sculpture come down means so much because as African Americans and as African American women, I think often that our resilience is mistaken for apathy and that often we are considered not whole human beings. And when I say whole in terms of that meaning the full depth of feelings, emotion, uh, pain, um, and all of these things that are often because of our resilience seen as uh, they don't matter. So this sculpture coming down, um, I'm not pleased that it's coming to Brooklyn, but uh, this sculpture coming down is an important part of history, particularly as we're discussing the Me Too movement, because art does matter, and sculptures do matter, and art does matter in terms of what, where we place value and what is important in our community and our society. And so today, this is one step um, on a journey of a million to right wrongs and to show that all human beings have value and that there's no one individual above an individual um, and that we can no longer continue to celebrate gains in our country and in our world at the expense of others or at the oppression of others. So today is certainly a historical day and I'm proud to be a part of this body and so many dynamic colleagues who work on so many different levels to make this particular moment happen. So I thank you, and it's an honor to work with you all. And I wanted to uh, jump right in. As far as the, the discussion on the diversity, equity, and inclusion, and we've had this discussion many times, and this is, of course, as we're discussing the Me Too movement, but it's also in terms of diversity. And we've had uh, numerous conversations about diversity, um, particularly as it pertains to hiring. Once institutions create these diversity, equity, and inclusion plans, what do we do to enforce these plans so that they don't remain just another white paper that sits on the shelf and time and time again we come back year after year with no real movement in terms of diversity, no real movement in terms of hiring, that we're gonna have protests and rallies and op-eds, um, and that this dynamic isn't changing. And so these great plans, they sound great, they look great, they play great at hearings, but we are still, four years in, not seeing the level of diversity, particularly at our larger institutions, whether it's on the board um, or curatorial positions. Um, we're just not close to reflecting the diversity of the city of New York. So thank you, and by the way, making the connection between what happened this morning and this hearing is something I've been feeling all day, mm -hmm. absolutely, as you say. Um, so the diversity, equity, inclusion plans, again, cultural institutions don't have these plans. Mm -hmm. So we're gonna be leading the way, I think, in the country to saying you have to have these plans. If they don't adopt these plans, there are going to be financial consequences. That also is unusual. That hasn't happened in other places. We're now working with folks who are experts in this field to understand what kind of diversity, equity, inclusion plans actually work to produce results. And so it's not just a matter of adopting a plan. It's adopting a plan that has goals and adopting plans that are, have a likelihood to succeed. So, we're you know, working with uh, 
consultants, and both consultants in terms of just sort of the idea of um, you know what constituent elements should be in the plan, but also what kind of plans are successful. And there's a lot of literature on this. There are books have been written. There's a book called On Being Included by a woman named Sarah Ahmed that talks about this that I've read. It's, it's um, a process that needs to be done consciously. We want to see a lot of different kinds of diversity, equity, inclusion plans, not one size fits all because we're experimenting in 33 institutions at once to see which ones are the most effective. Sometimes plans are quite short with very concrete, small set of goals, like we're going to do this, 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 and this. Some are much more philosophical and in-depth and lengthy. So we're hoping to get, to have this experiment be successful, to have these uh, organizations, we have a yearly review of their uh, plans, uh, and that uh, they submit uh, an annual report essentially to us in the fall. Uh, I mean, in the, we ask for it in the fall and get it in around February, around this uh, beginning of the year. So we're going to be reviewing those plans on an annual basis to make sure that these organizations are following through and these things are not sitting on the shelf. So, you know, we have seen some movement nationally in relationship to, let's say, curatorial diversity, not quickly enough, but uh, we absolutely are um, committed. And I, I do think it's a major step. These are board-adopted board diversity, equity, and inclusion plans in three to 33 institutions that constitute about half the cultural life of New York City. I think it's a major step. So two things to that. Um, one, I think that a plan, again, sounds good. I'll be honest, I don't have a lot of faith in the plan, but um, a few questions that I want to ask about that. So what I think that should happen is that when it comes to hiring, and let's just say we're looking at the CIGs, not to say I'm just discussing them in this moment, there should almost be a regimented or outline of where all the places um, job postings are going to be sent out to. So that there are publications that every time an institution, because we're receiving, these institutions are receiving significant dollars, and as a result of that, their postings should go wide and far. And so while they may come up with their own internal plan, I think that there should be an outward plan that specifically says, let's just say, you've got to go to the Russian Times, the Amsterdam News, Our Time Press, <clears throat> the Korean Daily Ledger, whatever the papers are, that way there's a way or online distributions or institutions or HBCUs or whatever it is because um, I don't want to single out a particular organization, but it is the 800-pound gorilla in the room. Um, I have tremendous amount of respect for the Brooklyn Museum, but in that particular case, um, the challenge that I have is that the outreach was not substantial. Um, and talking to other organizations in terms of the outreach that was done, th those organizations were not reached out to. So I believe that when it comes to um, not just the Brooklyn Museum, but if we're talking about institutions such as um, that focus on African art and so on and so forth, there are very few, if no, institutions throughout the city of New York that have African curatorial directors. Um, that's very problematic, but I feel that it has, it's a combination of two things. It's a combination of one, the institutions aren't doing the outreach. Two, I think that uh, the other aspect that needs to happen is that mm -hmm. For many of the funders, they also need to change, as well as the institutions, what are the qualifications for these positions. And we're not talking about lowering the bar, we're talking about looking at experience as relevant to PhDs or master degrees. We have um, artists and professionals who have been working in the field for decades, generations, that are uh, founders of institutions, have worked at major institutions, and those things could be um, uh, replaced in the way of how we look at who's hired and that sort of thing. So the, I think it's more than just a plan. It's also changing structural things in terms of who's qualified for the positions, what are the outreach that we're doing, um, how are we ensuring, what are, the what are the real penalties, and who are the people that are looking at these plans to say that 
These plans are being followed and implemented or not followed and implemented, and here are the concrete ways that we're gonna make sure that there's diversity <coughs> for women and people of color and so on. I've said a lot, so, but so I have I, a lot to say today. So I, I agree with a lot of what you just said. I'm not sure that there's a concrete question in that. But um, no, I, absolutely, I think that there are different ways to look at qualifications. And again, not it's not about lowering standards, but understanding uh, different kinds of um, approaches. And sometimes there's this sort of piece of paper that makes you somehow the only person who could get X, Y, and Z job. I, don't, I think that that is something to look at. I think it, the other major point you're saying is that, that <clears throat> you can't simply open the door that's been closed for generations and expect people to walk in the door without an explicit invitation in. That you have to say, it. so that's affirmative action versus sort of like equality versus equity. That to say this job really is available to you, you know, you can't just, again, if somebody has been denied access to a door, you can't just like unlock it and think they're gonna walk in the door. So I, absolute recruiting, being proactive, finding um, qualified people who have understanding of, of subject areas. I think it's all extremely important, and I think that, that those are elements of diversity, equity, inclusion plans, absolutely. Um, you know, for sure. I just, I'm, I'm gonna conclude, but I would say I think that the greatest challenge that I faced in these five years it's, it's not just in this industry. It's almost a, when it comes to discussing who's gonna be the next chancellor, when it comes to who's gonna be the next director, when it comes to all of these different positions, there always seems to be some reason as to why we can't find qualified candidates and people of color, and I'm simply not accepting that. I, I feel that there's so much more that we have to do in terms of um, identifying leadership, cultivating leadership, um, securing leadership, changing the dynamics of the qualifications, because working within communities, uh, having extensive experience, is really a very valuable tool. And at one time, let's say in the city council, the expectation was that you would be a lawyer um, to serve in the city council or to have come up through the political ranks. I really thank God that that is not the only way that you can become an elected official now is because you've had, you have a, a, a legal background. That there are people that um, have college degrees, there are individuals that don't. There are some that have doctorates, others that don't. There are people that come from the union world, the art world, small business world the educational field, and many others. And those different experiences are really what makes this body as significant as it is with all different types of legislation. And I feel that the city of New York really loses out because we only value one type of experience, and that's often academic experience. And there are so many ways for people to contribute without having a PhD or some of these other types of experiences. I wanna see more people of color with varied backgrounds, and I, I really hope that this just doesn't remain a paper that the next term of council members are going to have a hearing to determine that it was ineffective four years ago and we didn't move the pendulum in any way on this. I wanna see some real change through this. So that, that's all I wanted to add. Thank, Thank you, you, Chair. Very much, um, and I too am proud not to be a lawyer, and um, <laughs> uh, I was a library organizer, and uh, I think that's actually served me well uh, as a council member. So now I'd like, uh, and I'm thrilled that we're joined by uh, the chair of the Committee on Women, uh, someone who uh, has been appropriately lauded for her work in spearheading that historic uh, series of bills that have become law in the city of New York uh, dealing with this issue. Um, so I'm really thrilled to introduce Councilwoman Helen Rosenthal. Thank you so much, uh, Chair Van Bramer, and I appreciate that. And I'm really proud to have worked with all my colleagues here and with our speaker, Corey Johnson, in getting this package of bills through, I think it's the first package, like legitimate package, under his tenure. 
Um, so he really made clear what the priorities are. And I appreciate your having a hearing on this exact topic. I really do. Um, and your work, at your bill, having to do with the contract agencies, I think it's a great, um, and, and all the legislation, actually, I would say is a great first step, but we all need to be clear that it's first step. Um, there's a lot, there, this was just, um, we're just at the tip of the iceberg here, um, but there's so much more that needs to be done. And Commissioner, I'm wondering about your thoughts um, as Commissioner of this agency, whether or not you would be willing to move forward on some policy changes that weren't legislated, um, but that you know we all agree need to need to know about. So, for example, um, now uh, due to Councilmember Van Bramer's legislation, we will know that the contract agencies, in this case all 950, I guess, mm -hmm. uh, cultural institutions, has given a um, sexual harassment training. Yes. That's a big deal. And the harassment training now that the CCHR will have online is quite broad. I mean, it has not only the definition and examples and a phone number of where to complain, but also the bystander intervention training, which is incredibly important. But my concern is, and, and I think the arts as a particularly vulnerable uh, work employee situation um, where the vast majority of workers are, you know, um, don't have a lot of avenues open up for them and are really just waiting to be discovered. Um, that their protections, um, that we find a way for their protections to be meaningful. So one thing that um, would be great is if you knew as the commissioner not only that the harassment training was given, but also the number of complaints that came out of those cultural institutions. In other words, um, you know, part of the training is that management has to report on complaints mm -hmm. um, internally. And um, I think it would be meaningful for you to know that information, not just knowing about the stories that hit the papers, like what happened at the Met, which, by the way, both of those stories if I were a worker there, I'd be a little confused. I mean, one sexual harassment uh, perpetrator, it took a year just to start investigating him. And the other person was, you know, fired pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so how do you as the commissioner leading the way of these cultural institutions get them to move, move the ball forward even more? Yeah, I mean, so first of all, I. <clears throat> have just begun to get briefed on all the legislation and to, to understand sort of what it means as a city agency and also our responsibility in relationship to, to what we get contracted, how we get contracted. But I'm not exactly sure you're saying that, so we, the 950 groups that we give funding to, we, you know, it's an outside panel process and we have, you know, panel evaluating. So I'm not sure exactly what you're suggesting in terms of so is it a concrete suggestion related to the grant sure. giving process so, or? Uh, with the new legislation, they are now required to report on whether or not they've given a sexual yes. harassment training. Yep. I understand that. So that's great. Yes. Um, with the city agencies, your agency, for example, um, in addition to the trainings, um, there will be a risk assessment that the agency will have to undergo to see what areas of the workplace is there uh, more chance of sexual harassment. Mm -hmm. And not just the risk assessment, but the plan for what you're gonna do to deal with that issue. Yep. Right, so that's a next step. A next step is that the agency will be required to do is report to DCAS 
on the number of sexual harassment complaints that are made in your agency, and of those, how many were substantiated or withdrawn. Mm -hmm. That's a next step. Okay. Um, a next step after that is, so what happened with those complaints, with mm -hmm. the ones that stuck? What was meted out? in terms of uh, next steps to the, to the perpetrator. You know, was it pay docked? Was it lost days? Was it a training? Was it suspension? You know, the EEO lays out a number of yes. um, next steps. What were they? Mm -hmm. And I could imagine in your thinking about it with your different institutions, that there are some that are ginormous. I'm very familiar with, um, you know, American Museum of Natural History or the Metropolitan Museum. Right. Wouldn't it be interesting for you to know that um, there are more sexual harassment complaints levied at the American Museum of, at one institution versus <laughs> another? That's that's a place to go. One of the hardest places to go is with the smaller cultural institutions where someone would fear retribution, yes. right? And, and you have to sort of start thinking creatively about that. The reason I bring it here is A, because my colleague very wisely had a hearing about this, but because those employees are so vulnerable. Um, because, and I'm thinking of musicians in, you know, who are entrepreneurs themselves, you know, maybe work for themselves or, you know, trying to get gigs. Um, what, how, what more but, could we be doing? I mean, so I, look, we, this is long overdue, and I would admit, but I think that we're sort of at the beginning of this process in terms of that discussion. That to actually, I think, you know, I was there at the Whitney for that whole discussion. I plan to be at this next. And the next um, workshop is specifically for the smaller cultural institutions. And I think you're absolutely right that there's a, there's a unique vulnerability. But I think it's also important, A, to sort of educate people in terms of what your rights are and what your recourses is, are. So to just get people that basic information, but also listen to them and find out what's going to be most uh, helpful to those employees, um, you know, to bring forward the kind of stories like what are the real problems in those very tiny cultural organizations, which aren't, you know, often are individuals, there's the founding director syndrome, all these, you know, issues. Um, I have no idea also, and I don't know how you would verify this statistically, whether there is more or less sexual harassment going on in the smaller places than the bigger places, right? The bigger places have their own power structures that are hard to address. So I think it, you know, um, it's something I want to, you know, I'm, I'm not just want, I will take a deep dive into what is meaning, what these new laws mean for our agency in terms of how we operate, um, but then to understand what rules or sort of lessons we can learn from those laws in terms of how we deal with our grantees. But I, since I don't, so I'm, I'm just now learning about this new set of legislation, I don't know exactly how to translate it yet. Okay, um, I mean, that's a little disappointing because this is an issue that's been out in the ether for a really long time. And mm -hmm. I don't think it's just because I'm chair of the Committee of the Women that I've sat around and thought about it. But I mean, um, so uh, let me just, and, and happily, your lawyer is my lawyer. So um, if we could, if I just want to make this right, get this right. So one requir requirement now is that there be a poster that CCHR is going to come up with that is in plain language that, you know, gives examples and, and says what people's rights are. Does it also have the phone number on there, the hotline? We hope so. It, I'm sure the commissioner will do that because that would make sense. It hasn't been designed um, yet, right? So it's, yeah. Right. I, I know so one thing that would be very helpful as you consider what you're doing is um, the requirement is the poster go up someplace visible. Yep. Um, so one thing that would be great is as you, uh, in any interaction that you have with these 950 grantee 
you know, contracts or grantee partners that one question be, where are you posting your signs? Mm -hmm. That's an example of helping to make sure that the word gets out. Yeah, absolutely. And then, I mean, the thing also, when you think of like small non-cultural organizations, I mean, I'm thinking of places I've worked and I know exactly where that should go. The place where people congregate, the place where people have lunch, all that kind of stuff. There are many cultural organizations that actually don't have a place, right? So it's just run out of somebody's apartment. What do you do in those cases and how do you make, but they also have a workplace which could be moving around from place to place. Like they could be a theater company that doesn't have a theater but performs in a bunch of different places. So this is the kind of thing to understand how to best um, be in contact with those employees of those very small organizations is something I want to hear from the organizations as well. But I, I'm familiar with the... Well, I love that point. I mean, and my reaction to that is, this is great that you're thinking about it. So there's going to be the low-hanging fruit, the yep. Whitney's, the m and H, the Met, and then the middle-hanging fruit. I mean, Brenda, <clears throat> if I can just double-check, for the s posters, they go up in any business, or is that two with the 15 employees or more? Thank you. Sorry to put you on the spot. Trainings. Yep. Yep. Um, we'll Bye -bye. double check on there. all of this. We're but also, the point just I'm being sorry. that yeah. if you could, for all the ones that do have a place, yeah. perhaps you could voluntarily report back. You know, when, you're, when you report on saying, yes, they all have done sexual harassment training, you could report back yes, we've double checked, they all have their posters up. Um, you know, we don't have to, you know, put it in a bill. Yeah. Um, and that, or that you would say, uh, half of them did and half of them didn't. And we went after them. Here's a copy of the follow-up letter that we sent. And for the ones that don't have uh, a physical location, we have documentation that they sent out an email with the poster in mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. um, good, yeah. I think that's the kind, if you could spend some time thinking about it, that's how you could move it forward for the groups that are counting on you, for the workers who are counting on you for help. Yeah, I mean, this is, by the way, that email idea, so it's a great idea, and I have to ponder that. But in other words, to get, yeah, no, to get it to the people who need to see it and understand it and, and feel empowered to use it and call the number, it's not always going to be a lunchroom or something like that, and, but maybe there's a way to get it to them nonetheless, no matter what the size of the organization. So I guess just to end it, Chair Ben Bremer, um, again, I really want to thank you for holding this hearing, and perhaps at a future hearing, you know, in a year, we'll be able to hear back from the commissioner what the findings are, because the laws go into effect pretty quickly. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner, and thank you for your work this morning. It was a thing of beauty watching the statue come down. And um, I, I spoke with the community, this is the Marion Sims statue, I spoke with the community who are anxious to get involved in that community dialogue about what should go up in its place. And I think they would um, appreciate hearing, even if there's no information, they would appreciate hearing from you at their next Parks Committee meeting of no, Community, Community Board, Board 11. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, uh, Council Member Rosenthal. Um, just before I let you go, I just want to drill down further on a point that we seem to, I think, rightly have sort of focused on. And before you even said it, I was thinking about all those theater companies and dance companies that do not have a home. Um, we both know, we all know that there are lots of cultural organizations where there are two employees. And what if one of those employees is the managing director uh, who is harassing the only other employee who is the artistic director and running the operation? Um, and, and that's why I sort of come back to again both the agency having a role to play and you having a designated liaison to handle these kinds of issues because if it's two people 
and, and we know it happens, uh, or if it's an organization that only has one employee but has a lot of dancers or, or performers who are paid on a per gig basis but who come in and, and there's a really one employee of the organization, um, you know, who are they going to? Where is the poster if they're just renting space right. at junior high school 363 for the performance, right? Which we, happens all the time. You're funding those organizations, as, as we all know. We are funding those organizations, but oh, yeah. you're granting yeah. the money. Okay. Yep, and, and so I just wanna say uh, that, that, that I'm gonna keep pressing both the, the, the agency to have and play that role as the trusted source particularly for those who are in, in smaller organizations. And then also I think um, Councilmember Combo was going there a little bit too. With your DEI plans, in particular for the SIGs, but also in, in the paperwork for the program groups, you have the ability to ask all of those organizations about the number of sexual harassment complaints that have been filed and or how they've done. You could do that administratively. So, so once again, you're open to playing that role and having someone on the DCLA staff as, as, a, as a point person on sexual harassment complaints within the cultural uh, organizations that you fund in particular. And then number two, you are, uh, I would hope, open both in your DEI plans with respect to the SIGs, but then also with the program groups, open to asking uh, you know, you could ask two questions at a minimum and get a lot of information and actually know what we're doing in terms of how many sexual harassment complaints were leveled in your organization last year, uh, if any, and number two, what was the disposition of said complaints? So in terms of the first part, I mean, look, we're already engaged in the idea to try to figure out how we could be the liaison, get the right information to the right people. And so, again, we're not the enforcement agency, but we are already, have already started in this idea of, let's say, in a trusted and safe environment, introducing the cultural community to the people who actually do that work, which is the folks from these other agencies. So being that bridge is something, absolutely, we're already engaged in, we're interested in that. In terms of new questions, like I'll have to talk to my lawyers about what we can collect and not collect, or I don't know, this is a new thing that I'm being asked right here in live, and I've always been trained not to make any promises live and in person like this, but I absolutely hear what you're saying, and sounds interesting. And That's why we call them live hearings, and, uh, the, the, and that's why the, the questions are not in the can, and, and, are and, not. and, and it's important. So yeah. again, I just think, you know, if, if you had the legal ability to do it, which I think you do, uh, and you were able to ask all 950 organizations uh, two additional questions, right, on the forms, I realize it's a competitive uh, panel review peer process. We all know the process, but there are still forms that people fill out uh, in terms of drawing down the money and, and asking whether or not folks, uh, uh, an organization, whether it's two people or, or 20 people, because I agree with you that, that, that the sexual harassment isn't necessarily more systemic in an organization of three people as it is an organization of 1,500, but the person, the young woman who works for two men at a small theater company in many ways is a lot more vulnerable um, and having far fewer avenues uh, if she is being harassed. And, and that's sort of where I want to get at in terms of you all being that trusted source and being a place where she could go to if she's facing that because she certainly can't go to the other two, right? Absolutely not, yeah. yeah. So we'll, we'll pursue that. It sounds like you're open to it all but not committing to any of it. Uh, that sounds like a reasonable summary. I just want to associate myself with the comments and the recommendations of Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer. I think he's really on to a very important element to what this hearing is actually all about, and that really is bringing home 
uh, particularly for women, but for all people, uh, the dynamics that sexual assault is a really big deal, sexual harassment is a really big deal, um, and anywhere and everywhere that it takes place, it's a huge deal. Because what we've seen over the last four years is that there has been a celebration of a decrease in violence all across the city, but then there's a little footnote, except for when it comes to women. So that it's kind of this, as long as all other forms of, of uh, violence are down or crimes are down, but as long as it's happening to women, it's not as big of a deal we can still celebrate. And so I think that what uh, Council Member Jimmy Van Bramer is bringing up is critical to this conversation. And I want to also associate myself with the comments of Council Member Helen Rosenthal because I believe that what should take place um, in replace of Dr. Sim's sculpture is something that does revere and uh, acknowledge and recognize the trauma as well as the brutality against those women and that their memory should be celebrated, acknowledged, recognized, and a true story should be told there. And with the incredible legislation that Councilmember Jimmy Van Bramer and I passed in regards to the Percent for Art program, I believe this would be a tremendous opportunity to have an African American woman sculptor uh, to celebrate and to recognize those lives, and we have plenty from Betty Saar to Allison Saar to Barbara Chase Rabot to Chakaya Booker to Wageshi Mutu, Mikaling Thomas. We have plenty, and I'm here to assist and help so that we know that we can actually secure and find a prominent African American woman sculptor um, to tell that very important story. Thank you. All right. And I would like to associate myself with those remarks. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so uh, I think this is the beginning, right? There are a series of beginnings uh, here, long overdue. Uh, I do think a lot of really interesting ideas came out of uh, this discussion with you, Commissioner, uh, that I feel like all three of us feel very strongly about pursuing, and uh, whether that's administratively or legislatively. but. I think there's there's a lot more that, that uh, the agency can do. Uh, you're doing a lot of work. I know how much you care about uh, these issues, and I know how much you care about uh, all of the artists and cultural workers that you fund and support. But uh, there's always more that, that we can be doing, and, uh, and I think together we'll make sure that it gets done. So with that, I want to thank you for being here today, and we're gonna call up, I think we only have one panel um, of uh, uh, folks from the cultural community talk about their own experiences. So I wanna call up Wilhelmina Frankfurt from Dance NYC, Wilhelmina. Uh, Lisa Phillips from the New Museum. Anne-Marie Lonsdale from the Alliance of Resident Theaters. And I think we have four seats there. We have five uh, folks. So if we could all just come together. I think it's Leslie Mock from the Center for Arts Education and Nusrat Jaren Arifa, Young Feminist and Allies National Organization for Women. So if we can, uh, all five or are together, and we'll go from left to right, if that's all right with everyone. <laughs> I love this committee. Um, <laughs> yes, uh, why don't we start on, on uh, my left, um, and then we'll go right down. Um, and we're going to go to, uh, uh, just for time purposes, we'll have about three minutes each, right? I'm not going to um, uh, cut anyone off, uh, uh, but, but uh, if you can, be uh, sensitive to the, uh, the timer. Thank you. Just identify yourself before you deliver your testimony, and uh, feel free to begin.
is no it was not <laughs> Um, my name is Jaren Arifa. I'm the founder and president of the Young Feminists and Allies chapter of the National Organization for Women. We have quite a few members in New York, uh, but across the country also. I was also one of two students who spearheaded the sexual harassment policy for all of CUNY. And I did that while I was undocumented. So I have a firsthand understanding of how race, class, different things intersect and how we can create systematic change despite obstacles. So I want to thank the council for having this hearing and for giving me the opportunity to testify. As the cultural community moves forward with the recently passed uh, sexual harassment legislation, I wanted to share some of the lessons from our work at CUNY. We intentionally engaged in a two-year process because we wanted feedback from the various stakeholders. We wanted the policy to present represent the voices of half a million students and staff at 24 institutions. I think in that way it's similar to City Council. Our experience shows what you know already. Art has the power to change culture. And to end sexual harassment, we need a culture reboot. We need to change the culture that allows the entire spectrum of gender-based discrimination, everything from sexist jokes to sexual violence because experts consider sexual harassment and sexual violence the most extreme form of gender-based discrimination. These extreme forms of discrimination persist only because we allow the less extreme forms to take place, like the sexist jokes. Since graduation, I've continued my anti-violence work as a proud American citizen. I've designed, led, and evaluated trainings for hundreds on ending sexual harassment. In my work at both corporate and nonprofit sectors, I've seen firsthand how art can change culture. I hope you'll consider using similar tools on using art and theater to change the culture that allows sexual violence. And I hope that you'll bring the communities of artists together with women's rights advocates, because artists understand their craft, uh, but may not understand the nuanced uh, dynamics of sexual harassment. By bringing them together, we can create powerful change. I love New York City. I love this um, initiative. And thank you so much for giving me the time. Thank you, and uh, congratulations on so many levels. Uh, tucked within that testimony is a really, really incredible personal story as well. So uh, I just want to say thank you. I didn't want to interrupt you to congratulate you, but uh, I'm sure Councilwoman Rosenthal and I agree. That was pretty amazing stuff, so thank you. Who's next? Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Van Bremer and um, Councilmember Rosenthal, my name is Anne-Marie Lonsdale. I'm the Deputy Director of the Alliance of Resident Theaters of New York, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Corrine Woods, um, who is our program's coordinator. Um, we're really pleased to participate in this hearing. Um, over the past um, many months and years, uh, this movement has empowered artists to voice an urgent need to address sexual harassment, uneven power dynamics, and um, other gender-based violence that exists in the theater. Uh, from the audition room to the office to the rehearsal studio. Um, we, uh, this kind of gender-based violence has led to unsafe workplaces, ongoing sexual harassment and abuse, and created a culture of silence around victims because of the fear of being labeled difficult to work with, losing work, safety in the workplace, and ultimately also retaliation. Art New York represents hundreds of theater companies. Many of them, in fact, the majority of them, have budgets under $500,000 a year, and only a few. Um, staff members or you know people who are empowered uh, to run those organizations. These smaller institutions often lack codified policy um, to deal with sexual harassment and provide safe working conditions for their artists and cultural workers. And um, even in larger institutions where codes may be in place, power is so often skewed towards directors or other top artistic personnel, making change difficult and um, creating a layer of protection um, around abusers that enables them um, because of their perceived 
quality of their artistic work or their prowess as fundraisers. I also just want to take one quick moment to acknowledge the survivors in the room today and everyone who has voiced their survivorship. I think that's really important um, and to also recognize that there are survivors of all gender identities um, who suffer um, inside of these systems. Corrine's going to talk a little bit specifically about um, what we're hearing ab about and seeing in the theater community. Apologies, I'll be quick. Um, so I want to acknowledge that when we're talking about artists in this respect, we're not just talking about actors, but also technicians, um, artistic associates, designers. Power dynamics within rehearsal rooms and small theater organizations are, as mentioned, incredibly skewed towards the artistic version, uh, often of a single person or a small group of people at the top. And the realities of the theatrical working environments in New York City make artists highly vulnerable to harassment because they have multiple short-term employers, don't often know their employment rights, are constantly having to go out and ask for work, and have a lack of reporting op uh, options and mechanisms for doing so. We've also decided kind of as a society that uh, we have a balance of whether art is worth more than the humans who are creating it, and we need to look at a cultural shift that reevaluates the balance of those two pieces of the work that we're doing within the crea uh, creative and theatrical field in order to make humanity a more crucial part of what we're doing. So just quickly, um, in the testimony that we've submitted, uh, we've uh, addressed pretty in-depth uh, programmatic response that Art New York is undertaking over the next at least two years. So we're excited for you to read that um, testimony. And we hope that the work that we're going to do in this space will build accountability, center survivors, and create space for healing and justice for artists and arts workers in New York and hopefully beyond. So thank you so much for holding this hearing and for having us here today. Thank you. Thank you. Next. There you go. Lisa Phillips, director of the New Museum of Contemporary Art. Thank you, Chairman Von Bramer, and members of the committee for holding this hearing today. Um, the New Museum was founded in 1977 by Marcia Tucker, a woman, a feminist. I'm the second director. Uh, we have a lot of strong women leaders at the New Museum. Our board is over 50% women as well. So this is an issue that means um, a lot to us. It's close to us. So we feel passionately about it, um, and I personally do. Uh, we started talking about this several years ago before the allegations broke. Um, and uh, when they started coming fast and furiously in the fall, we gathered together a group of our staff and our board uh, and had a conversation, a very frank conversation. Um, about what we might do. Um, and then we decided out of that well, we had to take some concrete actions and organized a series of uh, workshops in March um, around uh, this issue. First, uh, what is harassment? How do you draw the line? Second, upholding due process and, and what our responsibilities are there. Uh, dealing with the transgressions and gray areas around this issue, and there are so many, uh, and that's really a place to drill down because we, we see a lot of that. And then finally, changing the balance of power and getting what we deserve, which is, you know, the power dynamics are such a big part of this. Um, they were overwhelmingly received. We had people from both the not-for-profit and for-profit sector, people from very small organizations to the large museums, um, and there were many, many people from other museums that came to us. They're all looking for a place to get, to have the conversation, to get information, to um, find resources, uh, because they're really, it's lacking, as you all noted. It's just, it's not there, so um, it's, a, it's an opportunity for us to step up. Uh, we did publish our findings on our website. We shared it with uh, leaders in the field. Uh, what we learned, one in four women are harassed. 84% of those reporting harassment are women. Only 25% of those harassed report the incident. And 75% of those who do report uh, say that they uh, faced retaliation. I mean, those are well-published statistics, but it's worth repeating. <laughs> um, and then we... Um, 
made a list of recommendations for both employers and for employees. One of the things I should just mention, this is on our website, I'm happy to share it with any of you that would like it, all of you. Um, but one of the things that did come out in the course of these workshops at almost every table is that there were repeated instances of donor harassment. Mm -hmm. So that's something I just want you to think about. It's not only within staffs, but also with donors. Absolutely. I, my time is up. Okay. Next. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you uh, to the committee for the opportunity to speak, speak to you today about um, the effects of a quality arts, educa arts education on gender equality. Um, my name is Leslie Mock. I'm a professional musician and also an intern at the Center for Arts Education. Um, a year ago, I graduated from Berkeley College of Music and have since worked as a performing artist and educator. Um, my experience as a teaching artist has opened my eyes to the palpable and demonstrated power of dance, music, theater, and visual arts, and how it continues to engage our students and impact our schools and communities. Arts education offers students rich and creative hands-on learning experiences, experiences that illuminate a process of rehearsal, revision, reflection, and challenge us to think deeply about our social behavior and responsibility as respectful and inclusive citizens. Uh, the Arts Education Partnership, a center within the Education Commission of the States, recognizes arts education as a key to ensuring student success in the workplace. The arts embody the characteristics of socially and culturally responsive pedagogy that can lead to the affirmation and validation for girls by nurturing a sense of empowerment and in promoting their voices. This engagement through a high quality and culturally responsive arts education supports them in non-vocational ways and expands their intellectual and emotional developments as they mature into thoughtful, critically thinking women and enter the workforce. Increasing women's and girls' education contributes to higher economic growth. Research has reported correlations and associations of arts education with increased GPA and reduced dropout, but more recent studies have shown additional student level outcomes, such as socio-emotional qualities to enhance what we know about the relationships between arts ed education, academic performance, reduced dropout, and overall increased student success. The ability to manage behavior, make decisions, learn from mistakes, self-criticize, and reflect are all immediate outcomes of an arts education. Uh, in a 2016 study of schools across Philadelphia, researchers found that prior attitudes play an important role in determining the impact of arts education. The study found that nine-year-old students who participated in a music program increased their tolerance for the perspectives of others, increased their growth mindset, and boosted their academic goal orientation. And across all age groups, students who showed higher levels in certain domains of socio-emotional development prior to participation in an arts program went on to experience a disproportionate benefit from the arts education. In 2011, federal report from the Committee on the Arts and the Humanities also shows that high quality arts education develops habits of mind, including problem solving, critical and creative thinking, dealing with ambiguity and complexity, integration of multiple skill sets and working with others. Um, I'd just like to end with um, expanding arts access and equity city, citywide starts with school day instruction taught by qualified arts teachers. They are the seed in which great art programming grows. I am lucky enough to have had great arts teachers who've built a rich and engaging curriculum in the public schools I've attended. It's helped me see the world from different perspectives and understand people, places, periods of history, and issues with which I may otherwise be unfamiliar. But most importantly, it's taught me to be a confident, self-assured, and independent woman. Arts education can be crucial to changing attitudes and in accepting gender equality as a fundamental social value. I hope that every child in New York City can experience firsthand the benefits of a quality arts education so that we can continue to build socially responsible citizens. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Last but certainly not least. <laughs> Oh, wow, wow, wow. What an incredible meeting. Thank you so very much. Uh, Chairman Van Bramer. I'm Wilhelmina Frankfurt. Um, I was a former ballerina with the New York City Ballet Company, and I am now a 
dance educator, certified public school teacher in New York City, working in the South Bronx with, um, at a school for K through five, developing a program for children who are really and truly underserved, who deserve the same training that all of the <clears throat> not yet equity inclusion is available at the School of American Ballet. So in November of this year, my whole life changed. I'm one of the first people that came forward about Peter Martin's allegations, which are not corroborated, uh, but the case is closed and sealed, so you should know. I'm just going to read my op-ed from Dance Magazine. I'll try to go quickly. <laughs> In 1994, I began to write a book of essays about my life in dance, mostly as an exercise. When the hashtag MeToo movement began this year, I knew it was time to brush the dust off and take another look. Although incomplete, these essays address the roots that have long run between sexual abuse, alcoholism, and ballet. They involve George Balanchine, Peter Martins, and numerous stars of the New York City Ballet. It's painfully clear that my story is the same story that has occurred thousands of times all over the world. That story is essentially this. An abused and or fatherless child is brought by an ambitious mother to the court of the fairy tale castle to perform for the drunken king. The girl soon learns how to get and keep his attention and roles in ballets. She learns how to maneuver in a deviant alcoholic culture. She learns how to ignore boys her own age and seduce old rich men who write checks for the company. And if she is smart, she marries one of them before she is 30. For by that age, she's usually too old to dance. One of my essays was published in Psychology Tomorrow magazine in 2012. And in light of the Harvey Weinstein accusations, I unearthed the link and posted it to my Facebook page. It sparked a conversation about the sexual misconduct and the abuse of power in the ballet world. The subject became Peter Martin's. He is currently being investigated. He is now retired, in case you don't know. <clears throat> I have to this date been contacted by all interested parties in the press, the School of American Ballet, and the law firm conducting the investigation for both New York City Ballet and the School of American Ballet to speak out further about Martins. I have the utmost respect for Sarah Kaufman from the Washington Post, who I worked with on this for months. Kelly Caspol's story of mental and physical abuse in the Washington Post paints a clear picture of that aspect. Am I a victim of Martin's abuse? Can I finish? Yes, of course. <clears throat> Am I a victim of Martin's abuse? Yes. Was it sexual? Yes. Was it consensual? No. But my own trauma is a surmountable issue. What keeps me up at night is the thought of how many dancers still live in fear, subject to the confused sexuality and morality of these powerful people. Why are they not educated, informed, and protected? And who are the adults that turn their heads the other way knowing what they know? I pose this question. Is Martins being thrown under the bus to avoid address addressing the larger, more deep-seated problem? Shouldn't the board of directors of both organizations and all related organizations be a part of this investigation? Unearthing lurid de de details of past abuses for public consumption is, to me, far less important than exposing 35 years of cover-ups, mismanagement, greed, and corruption, all of which created a toxic dangerous work environment for generations of vulnerable dancers. Thank you, Dance Magazine, for the opportunity to speak in my own voice. I have a statement from Dance NYC. I am on their committee to address this issue. I'm available to help, and I just want you to know that. And um, we certainly did a lot of research in our meeting at Dance NYC one very, very cold night about these smaller organizations. I gave you a list of um, organizations that can be, you can get in touch with. It's not published, but I could certainly give it to you. And um, I'm, I'm thrilled that there's some progress being made. You know, I, I, it's, my life has, I've lost a lot of friends. I've gained a lot of friends, um, you know. I, I have stories which I are too horrible to tell and you don't need to hear. But um, to me, in my life at this point, 
and I'm old, if I can do anything to help younger people not have this experience, I will do whatever I can do. Thank you for letting Thank me you, speak. Thank uh, you for, uh, for everything you're doing to help other uh, young women and um, for, for having the courage to, uh, to come forward and share. Um, and just looking at your, your list of organizations, um, when I talked about my situation, obviously no two situations are alike, and, and I'm not equating anything, um, but when, when I uh, had this experience, my experience, um, I went to the Anti-Violence Project um, oh. uh, because it, it uh, is the Gay and Lesbian Anti-Violence Project. Okay. But I knew about that because I had volunteered for them, and, and they had uh, and provided me an advocate. Right, and that advocate then represented me and went to the board meetings and helped me file the formal complaints and, and go through the process, which was dreadful in its own way because of yeah. the fighting that, that took place then um, as the board resisted you know, uh, doing anything. So, um, so thank you. Um, I wanted to ask the panel, because you heard obviously a lot of the discussion um, around both the smaller organizations that you referenced and whether or not you think uh, the Department of Cultural Affairs, were they to have someone on staff who could be a liaison, would that be helpful? Is that a meaningful uh, addition? It's not a solution, and there is, there's no one um, thing that's going to solve this, that, that the deeper cultural shifts that, that both of you talked about ultimately are, are gonna go um, a long way, but is that helpful? And then um, in terms of the transparency and, and uh, the reporting that we're talking about, is that helpful? So I, I just I'd like to speak to the transparency. I, I, um, it's something that uh, it's been a discussion in my community that it's, to me, maybe the largest issue because there's, you know, there's there's so much of this, I can't tell you. So, um, you know, we have to be transparent in, in school. We have to, other organizations have to be transparent. I, I think transparency is, is vital. And a person to go to, if you're a small organization, just a human being that you can reach out to, someone who can, that's awesome, in my opinion. I couldn't agree more, and I want to lift up two things um, that I think are critical. One is the relationship between money and power, and any organization, mine included, that's giving away money needs to think about the structural power that that uh, entails, and so any grant-making organization or organization, government, private foundation, or otherwise thinking about ways to resource the field needs to be aware of their position um, in terms of being able to affect change. And I think that we've seen that happen in other arenas um, that have not been replicated around gender justice. Um, and I'm happy to speak more specifically about that. Uh, but then, you know, also, just wanting to, um, sorry, I totally lost my train of thought. But yeah, wanting to kind of lift up this idea that there are, um, there are mechanisms for reporting that exist that are both anonymized and, um, and not, that use technology as a platform for reporting um, of sexual abuse and sexual violence that could be implemented for the workplace, um, and that there are already a number of really powerful um, extra governmental solutions. Um, HR and the Arts is one, wanting to lift up survivor uh, Marin Ireland in her work, um, and other sort of programmatic responses and responses that can create space for survivors to figure out how they choose to address issues. Um, I think that uh, we need to think about the ways in which the justice system can re-traumatize victims, and we need to be really conscious of that in the creation of responses to this kind of violence, um, which exists on a spectrum, as my co-testifier so rightly mentioned. 
I wanted to speak uh, specifically about having somebody um, at the Department of Cultural Affairs who's responsible. Um, I think it's an amazing idea. What I would caution against is that person not report to the Department of Cultural Affairs. Because in my work with sexual assault policies for universities, um, t their schools are required to have a Title IX coordinator, but they report to the university. So we're basically asking Title IX coordinators to blow the whistle on their employers who can then fire them. And so it creates a just impossible situation where they're not able to do their jobs. So I think this person who might be a liaison for the cultural affairs community should actually report to city council and not, not be scared that, you know, I mean, how many of us would feel comfortable telling our bosses that they're screwing up? So I think having that um, independence would be really helpful. Anyone else on the panel want to address those two questions? I think having more resources available to people is important. Um, as we've seen, there's a, a big need for that. So you know how that's provided, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, but I also think sending a strong signal to uh, the leaders of cultural organizations and to their boards is really key because it's, the whole culture has to shift. So sending that strong signal over and over again um, as we've started to now with diversity and inclusion is important. We just have to keep at it. Um. Graduating from a um, music school and also having most of my friends and peers also going the same path, I would say um, there's just a lot of uh, oversight in elite uh, music schools, uh, music institutions. Uh, just in the fall, 11 teachers from Berkeley were fired from uh, for sexual harassment. Right now um, at Juilliard, there's a Title IX suit. Um, so. I think that there just needs to be mandatory sexual assault training at all of these institutions, particularly because um, I think after the military, it's the most, um, there's the biggest gender gap. And um, for some schools, actually, it's the number one uh, institutions for gender gaps. I wanted to, um I wanted to uh, single boost what she said about mandatory training. So when we worked on the CUNY policy, I actually started working on the policy because I wanted mandatory training. So as a women's rights activist, I kept coming across uh, my um, fellow students who just had horrific stories. And I didn't want to just help them after the fact. I wanted to prevent it. And mandatory training is key, because if you tell an agency that they need to do training but not spell it out, they will do the least amount of work possible just so they can check off the box. So mandatory, what we found through our research and um, in my written testimony, I included information uh, from the New York Times where they looked at research across the country it has to be in-person mandatory prevention training. It cannot be online. And it has to be a certain amount of hours. It has to be a certain number of times. And I think really spelling that out for different organizations. And maybe this liaison um, for the Department of Cultural Affairs can check up and make sure that this training is being done. So I wanted to, um, we talked a lot, uh, both uh, Brenda, Chloe, and myself, about that number of uh, that we have in our study of 81% of, of women reporting um, uh, harassment, which I think is low. Um, and we talked about part of the reason uh, we think that's low is because uh, um, there are probably cases where women uh, don't believe that what happened uh, merits that or is, in fact, harassment. But I think there is still a lot of work to be done there in terms of uh, uh, letting everyone know what is and what is not appropriate. Um, and um, and I, I recall a very recent situation where uh, we went into a, a classroom uh, of, of, a, of a technical school where everyone was sort of 
building things, um, and uh, there were young men and young women in the classroom, and a very powerful male figure um, greeted everyone with me, and then somehow noticed that uh, some of the young women had nail polish, um, and uh, then asked to see all of the, the girls' nails, um, uh, which I thought was a really bizarre request, um, uh, as all of them were sort of mechanically putting things together. We didn't ask to see the boys' nails, uh, if they had done their nails. And it, 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 it was just one of those really, you know, odd instances where all of the young women maybe didn't think anything of it and, and you know, did show the nails. Um, um, but I think it happens all the time, so I guess I wanted to ask all of you, too, about that piece of it, which is um, what constitutes harassment, how each of us experience that um, sometimes in different ways, and um, but it's always wrong, um, and uh, and we know what it is when we experience it, um, but we have to also talk about what it is and what it means and what it feels like, and and um, that's a culture shift thing as well, um, uh, both you know <laughs> for. Uh, maybe that very powerful man, um, to know that that was sort of a ridiculous request and a ridiculous question um, to ask. Um, but maybe also for those young women who maybe thought it was a harmless thing to, to, to show our nail colors and, and to, to make sure that they were somehow nice even though we were putting together engine parts. Um, just very bizarre. But I open that up to all of you in terms of the culture shift question and, and and what is, and when, when, what is sexual harassment? So as someone who's um, led a lot of trainings, um, that's one of the topics we cover, is to really drill down into what is harassment, because I think most people are good, and they don't want to offend other people, but most of us don't know when we're being offensive. And it's, it's a learning process. You know, we don't have to think about an identity that or a situation that doesn't affect us. Like, as an able-bodied person, I had to learn about disability and how it affects and, and make sure I don't say words that are offensive. Um, so I think there's a big education piece. And I'm so glad you pointed out about the women who didn't recognize. Um, so research shows that about 40% of women if, uh, who are sexual assault survivors, when they're asked if they've ever been raped, they will say no because they, it, there are two sides to it. One of it is um, there's such stigma with being a survivor that they would rather tell themselves it's something else. And the other part of it is saying they did something wrong, so it wasn't sexual assault, so this will never happen again. So I think that education piece, again, becomes crucial. You know, when we get hired, um, most of us have employee books, or even if it's a smaller community, there's, there's some kind of orientation process. Um, at CUNY, that's what we wanted to do, is it needed to be part of mandatory orientation process when you join an organization to learn about these things. Um, yeah, I wanted to touch on that. I think the education piece, as you have very eloquently stated, is so crucial, but I think that it is much more expansive than we traditionally think of anti-harassment training as being. Um, part of that is we, as a culture, are working off of a model of consent that says that everything is okay until someone says no, mm -hmm. rather than the, it is only okay for you to utilize my body and my emotions in a manner that I actively and affirmatively consent to and say yes. That is a cultural shift that also needs to happen and is really crucial to be part of this harassment training so that we don't get these responses by powerful people of saying, well, she didn't say no to me, so how could I possibly have known? Um, so that was part one. Um, part two, uh, the, I have lost my train of thought. Um, the model of training as well that once again, we're talking about a, a culture and a population of um, employment that is very strange. Um, it is a gig economy. It is, uh, for many of our member theaters, 
actors or artists aren't employees, they're independent contractors, they're volunteers who are getting travel stipends in, um, as uh, compensation. And within those, how do you put together a training program for people for whom they spend eight weeks at one job and eight weeks at another, and how do you put any kind of structure across um, all of them? And I think that this is, is a space for some of art service organizations like Art New York as well as city government and other um, funders and organizations that work with um, individual employers to help to bridge some of those gaps to make some work standardized and to make their, uh, make their a baseline of what we expect behavior within the arts to be. Just super quickly in terms of um, culture shift, um, I want to lift up the idea of pay equity, in particular with reference to um, you know, artists and administrators who are working in small cultural organizations, often, you know, as my colleague mentioned, being paid um, either as independent contractors or um, as itinerant workers, um, but that, you know, so many women, I think, are involved in what we affectionately refer to as the nonprofit industrial complex. Their labor is considered to be feminized labor. Um, we're all sort of thought of as volunteers and non-professionals, and that that sort of, that misogyny infects the entire field. Um, and it's something that I personally have experienced um, and that I, I know that other colleagues of mine have experienced as well. So, you know, our, um, our current fight for 15, um, the way that the minimum wage laws are, are changing how um, our small organizations in particular can interact with their even seasonal part-time employees um, is, is bringing around a huge amount of heat. Um, but I would just want to lift up um, like women and femme of center people um, and especially women of color who are consistently underpaid and paid less than co white colleagues and male colleagues. I agree that mandatory uh, anti-harassment training is really critical um, and something that probably should be required for anyone receiving funds from the city. Um, also, we learned in our workshops that harassment is, is never about your intentions, and I think a lot of people feel their intentions are innocent or even um, well-intentioned, but it's about how the person receives or perceives what you say or do. So there is a responsibility um, to say, to speak up, that doesn't make me comfortable, or. You know, and that, that does get into the gray area. Um, it's sexual assault, unwanted touching, that's all clear, but there are many things that aren't clear. So there's a lot to work out, and that's where the workshops are important. And we're gonna have one tomorrow. Anyone else? I, I think the workshop, it's also, I also think it's essential, I completely agree with that. Um, there are some things that are specific to dance and I think that that poses a problem in the arts because there are some things that are specific to each art form. Um, dancers, tremendous body shaming that goes on and it just starts in ballet school when children are very small. And um, there's also a lot of hands-on touching dancers when they're being corrected and I I have completely changed that and when I am in a position where I can do this, I say to others, I always ask a student first, is it all right for me to touch you? Um, you know, I'm just single-handedly pushing that myself at this point, but you know, it's an idea. Uh, I think that uh, dance teachers should also get this training about because body shaming is it crosses a sexual line actually and um, it does a lot of damage so um, defining perhaps defining in each art form what is and isn't sexual harassment might be something that we need to do um, um, there are some things that are universal but there are some things that are not 
And dancers are very, very young. They're, it's like gymnastics. It's like the gymnasts, you know. So um, we, something we're talking about at Dance NYC, for sure. But um, the, all of this is very helpful. And workshops, I think if there's a way to come up with some kind of universal workshop that can begin to be done or handed out to organizations, large or small, and you have to do this for your organization would be fantastic. And I'm happy we're having the conversation. Thank you. Um, sorry, one more point. Um, when we're talking about the definition of harassment, which you had um, asked about earlier, I did want to make sure to bring into the room as well that some definitions of harassment, especially um, in some legalities, is uh, defined as attraction, and that is incredibly reductive. Uh, I myself have experienced sexual harassment from people who are not attracted to me, who identify as gay men. Um, so that is also something that we need to start testing that definition of what harassment is, um, as well as recognizing that while this committee might be specifically focused on sexual harassment, the, abu uh, the overlap between non-sexually based abuse, harassment, and bullying within the artistic space and those power dynamics are very closely linked with the sexual harassment that we've really seen the proliferation of recently. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, the work that I do, I come across more people experiencing bullying that doesn't necessarily have a sexual tone to it. And um, Americans, I think 70% of Americans have reported being bullied at work. That's mind blowing. And some of that is sexual harassment, but there's just, I mean, sexual harassment is about power structures and so is bullying. So the, the dynamics are very, very similar. Um, I also wanted to just piggyback off what you said. This is why in my uh, testimony, I talked about bringing together artists with women's rights activists, because I think each art form will look slightly different on what the sexual harassment training looks like. And by bringing somebody who is, in, who is an expert in dance with somebody who's an expert in this type of training, I think we can come up with really amazing individualized programs. Uh, so I want to thank you. I, I meant to thank Commissioner Finkelperl for sticking around, but he just had to, uh, to leave. But he. He did stay and listen to uh, uh, virtually all of the testimony, and, and I appreciate uh, the commissioner doing that. Um, so I, I think this was a really, really important discussion to have at the city council and for our committee. I thank all of you for being here, and you know, as the chair of the committee, uh, the person who fights for all this funding that that and then Tom gets to give away, um, and and. You know, I get to go to all these organizations, and 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 I do think about this all the time. And 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 I'm glad you brought up the very specific circumstances of dancers and 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 ballet dancers, because I I I think about that all the time with respect to this. Um, that um, uh, there are different norms, there are different practices, um, and different vulnerabilities, and, and I sort of wanted to get at that a little bit here, which is, uh, which I think has happened. So I also think uh, some really good ideas were brought forward by all of, of you, um, and we will definitely continue the, the discussion with the Commissioner and the Department of Cultural Affairs, but I want to thank all of you for being here and being a part of this really important discussion and for sharing uh, your experiences and, and uh, potential solutions. So with that, thank you very, very much, all of you. Uh, and that concludes this hearing of the Committee on Cultural Affairs, Libraries, and International Intergroup Relations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.